Jew who was a male. He, you know, he, he leaves with his family uh, to Spain. Yeah. Well, no, from Spain to England, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. And then they end up in Mexico City. And the Inquisition happened in Mexico City too, so his parents are burned at the stake. So he comes to San Miguel. I mean, it is a, it is a fiction, and we're historically researching constantly about, because Father Hildal goes in as a reincarnated nun when his head was lopped off mm. and as a totalita <laughs> his, his, his spirit took over this nun who was dying okay. um, so we have things like that of, of the, the black vampires and the white vampires but we're not having werewolves and things like that we're trying to keep it really real wow. I wrote I wrote both books to explain what what it is like to be a single woman in Mexico but also it was more of, don't do as I've done, learn by my mistakes. And I've had, when I was writing as a blog, which I still do have a blog with the most read chapter of that one, and I change this one out every month, and I'm writing a third book right now called Trace Vampires. And it's actually three characters that are people I know, including myself, in San Miguel, but we're vampires. So there's a lot of people who recognize themselves, but it's a historic, it's a historic fiction. So it's totally different. But I've had 50,000 people read my blog, even before the book was published. And they contact me on Facebook, they contact me by email. And it's mostly women saying, oh my God, I'm you. But unfortunately, some of them want to be me. And that's not what the book's about. <laughs> yeah, don't be me. Don't be me. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? That's, that's hard to spill out, isn't it? It, it is. And um, I was talking to you earlier, um, everyone else didn't hear it. The first book was actually, was actually written um, as a journal because my psychologist asked me to journal because I had a lot of issues about deaths that have happened in my life. And she suggested I journal. But I think that it's a marketing ploy because you get all these people who read and respond, like things, don't like things. It kind of helps you with what your audience is. And um, so I did it that way. And the people who read it, I never intended ever to publish it. I was pushed to publish it by all the people who had read it. Well, they gave you um, well, I'm, I'm not writing an autobiography anymore, but I'm using people I know in this historic fiction, and they'll recognize themselves. A lot of them ask to be a character, and some of them in San Miguel, I, I would like to be a character. And I'm, I, I don't see that. <laughs> you know, they get a little insulted. Well, that but. kind of... And places is also... Right now. So, so we have friends who own a piano lounge, and she doesn't <laughs> really sing there, but we made that, we made her a, a regular vampire, a vampire of the night, where we're vampires of the day. Um, a woman in the Baja 
goes to Puerto Vallarta to meet a man who she met on Corizon.com. And he sucks her blood, but also has sex with her, but she doesn't normally do, turned her into a vampire and wanted more, but he didn't understand why. So he fed on two other women in Puerto Vallarta who all didn't know what had happened to them. And, you know, they became friends, found out they were staying in the same hotel, were there pretty much for the same reasons, and they went to San Miguel looking for him. Um, I had a friend who became a friend of mine who found me from Dallas. He's Mexican and he writes vampire books. And um, he's Mexican, so English is a second language. And he found me because my blog, which has the most read chapter in that book, was called Skinned Alive by Vampire and Ahi Heat. So he found that Googling vampire things. And, and I said, Demetrio, is English your first or second language? And he said, it's my second. I go, all right, that explains it. Because word, you're trusting word. And it's putting wrong words in. So would you like me to prove it? And he said, sure. And then my friend Rebecca is a, a Greek scholar. And she said, well, I'm an editor. When you're done, if he doesn't mind, then I will edit it. And then the three of us, I, had, I actually came up with the idea of Trace Vampires because I have an imagination when I was driving from Baja to San Diego to my medical treatments. And I was thinking, because we have this group of women and I call the sisterhood. And I was thinking, because you know, vampires are big right now. Have always been. And I was thinking about what we would call the sisterhood. If I can, I, I put all these people in the book, and we are hunting in America and bringing guys back, and we're kind of like, you know, just draining their blood a little bit and keeping them going and having sex with them or something. You know? <laughs> but it, but we weren't looking for boyfriends. Right. For we were just looking for blood. <laughs> So that's how it began in my mind. So basically, it's, it's taken a long time because I write the story. I read to him the other night, uh, the first chapter, that the way I wrote it, and it was only eight pages. And now it's you know, 55,000 words because it goes from me to Demetrio, who as a man adds sex to it. It comes back to me to approve it or not and come up with other ideas and send it around. And it goes around six times. Yeah. The book that somebody has signed a letter to me years before. And as I read it, it was three pages, but the end of his letter just seemed perfect for the end of my autobiography. So I'll share it with you, because it's not going to give up what goes on in the book. I have a male friend who is a writer who sent me a letter 18 years ago. I found it recently and it is perfect as my ending to this book. I am therefore sharing it. You are writing the most important book of all, the autobiography of your life, and you have many more chapters to write. There are plenty of pages left for love, enlightenment, and vivacious moments of joy and ecstasy and caring. Just a wonderful richness of life still out there just waiting for you to tap. So I say go forth into the world with your remarkable beauty and embellished society. Your autobiography is the most important book ever published. I was not writing a book then, not until five years ago. I met him March 7th at LG in Ensenada, Baja, California for lunch. Not at a bar for happy hour, nor a local cantina to dance. He was tall, handsome, blonde, and was working, a plus compared to the men in Mexico I had met in the past. He stared at me throughout his business lunch, and I kept dodging his glances, pretending to be working on my laptop. Yet I was constantly staring out of the corner of my eye looking at him, and thinking about taking him into the bathroom and ripping his clothes off and having crazy sex. <laughs> After his lunch, he went up to the cashier, I presumed to pay. But in fact, he signed a note as the restaurant owed him money for an ad in his online magazine about the Baja. Then he came over and asked my name and introduced himself to me and gave me his calling card. As he left, he asked me to return to the same table at six that night and to order the best bottle of wine. He said he might be a few minutes late because he had a business 
to me the prior. I was on time as usual, and so was he. He kept pulling my chair closer to his, and he could not keep his hands off of me. People were walking by and staring into the window, watching us, wanting some of the effusive chemistry that we were experiencing together. Recently, La Giera told me that was merely pheromones, or as I would say, lust. As we stood up to leave, he kissed me passionately. For me, the first kiss is so important. This one was wonderful. I had walked to the restaurant and he had driven, but he said he would leave his car and walk me home. It took forever because at each block, he stopped to wrap his strong arms around me and he kissed me with intensive passion. When we finally got to my front gate, we both had to stop ourselves from tearing each other's clothes off. We barely made it to the bedroom. In the morning after a night of sex and no sleep, the bed was in the middle of the room and turned counterclockwise. He had been an equal and attentive sexual partner who seemed excited by playing my body and enjoying the reactions he orchestrated. I say orchestrated since he played my body like a musical instrument and was in total control. For a little over two weeks, every night was like this. We also talked and it was always true conversation and communication, each listening and wanting to know about the other. We watched movies at home and cooked dinner together. It seemed to me that I had found a compatible partner who was fun to be with and who shared many of the same interests but had enough differences to make life interesting. Even when we danced, it was in total sync with each other's moves. Then suddenly, he disappeared for a few days with no contact, and we were not yet friends on Facebook. My Facebook page is public and open, so I rarely request to friend someone, though I usually respond to friend requests. He had not asked me to be friends, and I thought nothing of it. Nor did I try to find his Facebook page and look at it, wondering where he had gone and what he was doing. Instead, I just went on with my life, as usual, in a bit of pain and wondering. So I did not see this post he made that was shared with me later by a friend. March 20th, Equinox birthday baby, by, shall we merely call him selfish? On Friday, 18th of March, 2011, at 5.08. Let's see, biggest full moon in 19 years tomorrow. 50th birthday at midnight, first day of spring. Been a party like it's 1999, Prince. Got two bands Friday and Saturday. They both let me get on the stage and sing with them. Reservations at the two best restaurants in Ensenada. Hot springs with a rock climbing wall on Sunday and a hot date. I guess I couldn't have imagined better. Plus my latest issue of BajaYes.com online magazine comes out maybe Monday if I'm not too tired. Stay tuned. We'll try to get some pictures. A few days after his birthday, that of course did not include me and this hot day that he had, he showed up at my front gate, banging loudly and calling my name. I should have ignored it, but I let him in and I began all over again, as if the missing time did not exist. That missing time was a problem, an obvious problem that anyone could see but I ignored the first sign. Again, everything was perfect between us. Yet, people kept warning me, and I ignored them. His partner in the magazine warned me. His employees, ex-girlfriends, and friends of both he and I warned me. Then a second disappearance. He went to Key West with his brother and called me each night professing love for me and missing me, only to return again and disappear again by moving back to San Diego without discussing it with me. As I ended my last book, I said I had found a wonderful man and I thought I had. So how does a relationship change in New York Minute? It doesn't. The warning signs were all there. I just chose to ignore them due to months or less and the false promise of love. <laughs>